Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Essays Espresso. I am Daniel, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Acer Aesthetics. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. And, of course, Bokenjima. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. How are you doing? <laughs> Fucking this dude already asked me. <laughs> We're trying to be cordial. I, I don't need you to be redundant. <laughs> Any, anyways, anyways, you know. You're no good, better think, a host than I was last time. I think that's not saying much. <laughs> <laughs> this is already derailed. <laughs> so... One of the good things about this show is that we take like two weeks before recording, so like we usually have more things to discuss as, as a result, or at least that's that's the theory, right? That's like the idea going into it. But like, I think you fucks only have like one or two things. So, <laughs> Boken, what have you been doing? Well, I've been playing a game, but also it's nice that you introduced me that way because I actually forgot to put a topic on this list. You motherfucker. Uh, so <laughs> let me just go ahead and post this and copy paste. But bam Are you fucking Fixed. ready? Oh, my butthole is clenched <laughs> in anticipation. Uh, Are you even looking at the list? No. I'm, doing I'm this waiting for, for you. To say Why? It. I'm doing this just for you. You're ruining my whole bit. Oh! Oh, look at the list! <laughs> Okay, okay, fine, fine. I'll look at the fucking list. Why, why don't you have the list open, you motherfucker? <laughs> because I'm going at You're the seat of my host. pants. I, I need to open up Google Drive. and <laughs> <laughs> My fucking God. <laughs> Dude, I have this whole thing planned out. Okay. Oh! No! You, you actually watched it? Yes. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> oh. How many episodes? All of it. We're talking about Fate Zero, by the way. How many yes, episodes? Yes, Fate Zero. All of it. I watched all of it. Wait, what? Really? You watched the yeah. whole thing? Yeah. Wow. Are you, wait, was, are you, I was are you quiet. messing with me? No, I was quiet on purpose. I didn't talk about it. Just to surprise you on, on this podcast. Okay. So for I, the viewers... I'm, I'm almost uh, afraid to ask. I'm almost afraid to ask. Did you like it? No. No! <laughs> really? No, no, no. I'm fucking with you. It's great. Oh, oh God, thank you. <laughs> Oh shit! You. But you know, I guess we should introduce Father. I was viewers, almost heartbroken. So, I was yeah. like, "That's like one of my favorite shows of all time." <laughs> uh, I guess we should say that you've been bugging me to watch for this for like a year now. I think. Has, wait, wait, wait! It cannot have been a year. I think it has at least a half a year. No way! That. Yeah. I, I no, think we I talked about like it during the three or something. Oh, wait, I guess it has been kind of a long time now that I think about it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I was, I've been loving Madoka forever, and I know you mentioned that at some point. Yeah, Madoka, because uh, one of the uh, points of, of uh, reference between them is that uh, Gen Urobuchi worked on both of them. So I was kind of hoping that that would incentivize you to watch Fate Zero. Yeah. Uh, like before getting into the show, though, you were kind of apprehensive about its use of like classes. Did that still bug you as you were watching the show or did you kind of get over it? Mm, I think that bugged me as a bigger point I want to make about the whole show. That is one of I guess that's one of my biggest flaws, which I didn't want to lead with that. But yeah, uh, the classes are a problem for me. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Where do we want to start? Uh, wherever you want to start. I mean, you're okay. the one who watched it. I mean, I legitimately mean it's it's a really good show. I enjoyed it a lot. And I'm, gl I think, I'm glad. I'm yeah, glad. I think it's carried almost exclusively by... Well, the action is good, but it's carried by the characters, for sure. Yes, it's it has very character-driven. It has a an extremely strong cast of characters that all have very... Uh, well fleshed out motivations and it's like it's almost exclusively about how like the characters influence each other yes like i would say my favorite absolute favorite part of the show is specifically how um gilgamesh influences kotomine yeah like 
Kotomine's character arc and the way he starts to like slowly because it's not really character it's in a sense it's character development but it's also like him accepting who he is and like just learning to fully embrace himself because he's he's because of the way that he was brought up he was kind of taught that those feelings that are like natural for him were wrong and it, Gilgam it took Gilgamesh to like really push him into just accepting what he is and yeah. I just I found that so fascinating and shouldn't we explain what the show is I'm Didn't sure explain it last time well kind of yeah I mean it's about the holy grail war and there's like seven summoners I guess who are chosen by the holy grail yes who fight for it the holy grail can uh fulfill a wish mm-hmm. and uh they get the the ability to summon a servant, which is like a hero from ancient myth, and those servants yeah, fight each myth other. Myth or history? Like yeah. I, I think the way that the show uh, describes it specifically, like it's even though it's myths technically, like within the show's canon, it's stuff that that actually happened. Mm. Yeah. Um, there are some exceptions, though. It is possible to summon a heroic spirit that isn't real like it, uh, someone that never actually existed but because that their story was so prominent throughout history that they can be summoned anyways but that's like that's like a whole other thing yeah and there's like a bunch of institutions like the mages and there's the holy church yeah and um then all these People and these institutions fight for who can actually get to the grail and fulfill his wish. And that's yeah, the, and whole, all, the whole thing. Yeah, and all the different characters have their own motivations. They all have different reasons for um, getting the grail. They have their own wishes that they want. So t- tell, tell us how you felt about it. Um, well, where the fuck do I start? Um yeah, where the fuck do I start? I don't know. I think, as I, as I said, it's it's carried by the characters. You just said, like, your favorite part is how Kotomine changes his... Like, he becomes who he really is. Yes. Um, I would say my favorite episode specifically, or, like, my favorite parts of the show are mostly the the parts where people just talk to each other. And the action oh, is yeah. great, but there's a seen towards the middle where Gilgamesh, Ryder and Saber sit down yes, yes, and just talk about what it means to be a king. And it's That's fucking one of riveting. The best. It is That's so one good. of the best. <laughs> yeah. It's just about like, okay, this one guy is really boastful and he, he inspires his men through just being an amazing, inspiring person. And then there's like Saber who's very mopey and oh I wanted to lead my people and they all were brought to ruin and then he goes like you you fucking bitch you're not strong enough I don't respect <laughs> you anymore and it's so cool like I I really enjoy these characters right Ryder specifically is so fucking amazing he's dude probably Ryder one of the so best good. anime characters I've ever seen Ryder is so fucking good like <laughs> If Ryder Ryder and Waver weren't in the show, like, it would be, like, two points below. Like, it would be two points worse. Because, like, they're the heart of the show. Yeah. All of the other people are treacherous and, and, like, they just are filled with misery. I guess there's also the the, um, relationship between uh, Saber and and Iris. Iris Veal. Mm, Yeah, which was wholesome. Yeah. But uh, Ryder is, like, this giant red-haired uh, muscle dude who, who conquered half the world or something. And he's summoned by Waver, who is a magic student that no one takes seriously. He's mocked by his teachers. He has barely mm-hmm. any magical abilities. And he just wants other people to respect him. And then he summons like this this dude as a servant who fucking could punch his face in at any given point. But Ryder is so so wholesome and so nice that like he really starts to respect waver for being such a weakling but still standing with him through all the fights and they also have just awesome moments where like right writers just like okay so if i win the holy grail war 
will you buy me pants? <laughs> <laughs> just like great moments like that. But yeah, that is yeah. wonderful. Just uh, right as so good. Every sh- every time he showed up, I was like, this dude is fucking awesome. He is. He's I so good. Because like, like er- all the other characters are just so down and depressed and like the stuff that they do. And it's like, if it's so depressing and waver and writer and their relationship and their antics even though like there, there's some serious stuff related to them as well but like they do such a good job of balancing the show they add a sense of brevity to it it keeps it from being like to one note yeah i mean we we talked about unrelatable characters last time and i think that discussion was sparked because someone talked to you about kiritsugu yeah right? so so how do you, how, having that discussion and now having seen the show, how do you feel? Um, I mean, I guess he's not very la- re- relatable, uh, but he is. He, his motivation gets explained towards the end. Well, although I have to say, his like the solution to what happens at the end. I don't know if I want to spoil that, but uh, I'd rather not spoil. Yeah, anything. I was. I, I didn't really fully get what happened at the end and i was wondering if that story is spun off later in other shows it didn't really seem like a full conclusion it that's because it's not yeah like you got to remember that fate zero is a prequel to fate stay night and that technically speaking the uh the way that fate zero ended the holy grail war did not finish properly to put it like that and as as a result because you normally i think i forget the exact number but i think it takes like 70 or 80 years or something like that before the holy grail war can like um can commence again and because of like the the weird nature of how it ended in fate zero like because of what kiritsugu did at the end um, the, the, the Grey War starts up again, like, ten years later in Fate Stay Night. Okay. But yeah, yeah he himself, he's at least, I would say, intriguing, because he's very, like, he's an anti-hero, if you will. He's mm-hmm. extremely methodical, he emo- barely emotes with anyone, and he just fucking kills people and assassinates them in cold blood. And that is our main yeah. character. But I think because of the way he acts like that, the few moments where he does show emotion hit harder. Like, I, I remember that one conversation he had with his wife on the roof where he was just like, maybe we should just like fuck this and just like leave. And yeah. like you, you and I can just like go together. And then she was like, that'd be nice, but you know you can't do that. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like the characters have just so much to them. They're so rich. Yeah, and they play off each other so well. Yes. And like they, like they the way- bring out aspects of each other like by just interacting and being around each other. Right. And like the way that Kiritsugu treats Saber, like he doesn't he doesn't respect her and he treats no. her like a tool. Yeah. And exactly. like the the one time they have like a kind of sort of discussion, barely, he's not even talking directly to her. He's like he's he's like talking by proxy with his wife and just like he and just like completely disrespecting her and and her code of honor. You tell Saber to pass the salt. <laughs> uh but you said that you had a problem with like the class system. So what what is your grievance there? So my grievance with the class system is not the class system itself. It's um that I think where the show fails me is an exposition because I cannot for the life of me understand the world these people are living in or what the rules are. Okay, that that's is, fair. It's part of the class system. Like people, there are seven summoners and they summon seven servants. And the servants mm-hmm. have seven different classes. Like there's one berserker and there's a saber. And the rules of the world in general like what what are these classes how do they interact you said last time or in the first episode i think that the guy who's actually the archer class doesn't fire a single bow yeah um 
so i don't know what what's that about what i never understood what these characters can and can't do that is my problem like there's a fight where um i think uh kire is fighting maya mm, yeah and he's shooting at him and he just comes at her i didn't even know kire can fight first of all so when he's just started fucking like being all acrobatic and shit and then running around that was crazy and then he starts reflecting bullets with his arms but he yeah. still has to has to cover his face because that can reflect bullets for some reason but i didn't know like i didn't understand why i didn't understand what he's doing i don't understand why why kire can just summon these fucking blades out of nowhere and uh, also the 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 heroes themselves like the the phrase noble phantasm gets thrown around and then all of a sudden Ryder just fucking turns everything around him into a desert and there's a giant army that fucks up another hero and I'm like what what is happening like, okay you yeah doing? you you can think of that as like a his uh, ultimate attack his ultimate okay. attack yeah but apparently the ultimate attacks of all of these people can just be anything like I, I can't uh, I can't predict what the fuck is going to happen so the fights I did I they they kind of like tension in the sense that there were no rules that I could anticipate you know what I mean kind of because I I understand the rules so I don't have this problem but but when do the, they get explained certainly not here okay yeah the visual novel does a much better job of explaining it because you also have to understand that Fade Zero was made after the visual novel and was meant to be was I mean I think it can still be enjoyed by people who haven't read it but it was kind of met made more with the intention that like okay it's, it's a lot of this stuff you already understand so it doesn't go through the motions of explaining all of it hmm so it's more for fans than just i mean i understood sure. most of it it's just um yeah the but like the specific kind of the specifics i'm sure were like difficult for you to grab onto yeah. as a result and it's um, also like, okay, there's a church and there's the, the mages and how do these institutions interact? Where, what do they do? How are they led? All that shit. Like, that never really gets explained. Um, that's meant to be a mystery. Like, the way that the, the mage association and the church and stuff, like, that's that's meant to be, like, mysterious. You're not meant to fully understand that. Hmm. No, I guess. Like what you're you're complaining about, like Ryder, like summoning the desert or whatever. That's called a reality marble. <laughs> yeah, that that word got thrown around too, and I was yeah. like, "What? The fuck it's yeah. it's a it's a mindscape." Like it's, you yeah. you, you see, I have to take a word for this right now, <laughs> and you can tell me this, and I still I, I still don't understand it. Yeah, fair, fair enough. I don't really agree when you said like the the fights lack tension. Like, cause I thought the I thought the the fights were pretty fantastic. The fights are good, but they they suffer from the problem that when I don't understand what the rules are, the characters can just pull shit out of their ass and decide the fight that way. Mm. Like when when I take something like uh, Boku no Hero Academia, and I see. Um, the main character fighting Todoroki, and he like you you understand the main character's powers. He has like he 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 creates shock waves with his fingers, like he snaps his fingers and creates a shock wave, but that breaks his finger. So I understand there's a rule there because he only has four fingers that he can snap, and then they start playing around these rules and actually like, uh. Like, he has so many attacks left and he has to come up with a plan to beat the other guy and all that shit. That I understand. When when Saber is fighting Lancer and then all of a sudden he has, like, a spear that is cursed and that curse does this and this and then Saber is weakened and I'm like, okay, I guess, fine. So what next? You know? Well, a lot of the abilities are also, like, related to that that person or that character's myth like their myth and their legend yeah sure 
there is obviously some creative liberties taken, like Saber shooting like a giant magical blast of energy. Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure King Arthur never did anything like that. Yeah, that's called Excalibur. And I understand what Excalibur is, but I don't understand what form Excalibur will take within the show because the show just, like the characters can do nothing and everything. It feels like. Not really, because if they can do literally anything, obviously, then nobody would win or lose. I don't know, like towards the end when only a few people are remaining and there's one character that beats another character very easily. I was like, okay, I thought that so far these would have a, a tougher fight and that they are on the on same playing field. Are you referring to Lancer? No. I'm, I don't want to spoil it, but... Okay. It's like when four characters are remaining and they face each other in pairs and one fight is on a bridge. Oh, um, okay, yeah, I know what you're... Into. I, and I, wouldn't like say it, that, I wouldn't say that character went down very easily. There was like two episodes dedicated to taking him down. Uh, no, it was one episode. And it's oh, wait, like, are you talking about towards the very end? Yes. Oh, that that's like one of the best scenes in the show. Yeah, it's a great scene, but I'm, I'm saying from a fight perspective, from an action perspective, it's a great scene because it has emotional weight. I'm saying from an action perspective... Um, well, I, it's not really a fight scene, really. Well, it's a fight. No. Really? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fucking clobbering. And that's that's the problem because... It, it was a completely one-sided were, affair. Yeah, but the characters were built up as, as having grown fond of each other and having grown a, a mutual respect of each other. So I assumed um, the characters would be on an even playing field. And I, I knew the one guy was likely going to win, but I didn't think he would just fucking destroy the other guy that that's because that other character is one of the absolute strongest yeah but he was struggling in other fights not really and and the fucking like the other guy was also built up as one of the strongest no and no one no one actually said when did that character no that character never struggled the character ah, you're referring to never the, struggled. He, against Berserker early on, he was surprised. He was surprised because he was giving him a minimal amount of effort. No, it's not minimal. And, and Berserker say. surprised him. Yeah, I would not say it's minimal. But um, that showed a for certain Gilgan, kind of weakness. For, for that character, yes. <laughs> that, that showed a certain kind of weakness that I would have thought would come up again in that final fight when you're actually towards the end and you're actually rooting for another character to at least make a dent and i really thought the other guy is way would be way stronger than that mm. you i i think by by that point though um waiver is no longer god we're getting the spoilers <laughs> yeah i'm i'm very like i'm, I'm really talking around it we don't have to get in that. I, I'm just saying yeah. it's it's hard to follow the rules of the show, in my opinion. Sure, I will. I will grant you that, and it wasn't a problem for me because I'm an obsessive fan, and I really already knew most of the stuff going into it. So all of it was stuff I already understood, and it do- didn't bother me. But I can understand for someone that's going into it like fresh, being like, "Oh, this I don't understand this." See, so it didn't it's... bother me that much. Um... Because there's still, like, the fights actually accomplish something and things change at the end. So I the, the fights still have, like, an, an action-reaction uh, principle, and that's fine. That's what I yeah, actually I w- get out of it. I would say, and the I would say none great. of the fights, it's I would just, say none of them were meaningless. When, fucking, like, when Berserker, like, suddenly pulls out a minigun, and then all bets are off. Well, Berserker's ability is that, like, whatever he touches becomes um, his noble phantasm. That's why when he got got on to... We gotta stop for a second, sorry. Okay. We should uh, try to move away from this. We're 26 minutes in. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, okay. So, anyway. um, I'm back now. Okay. 
All right, let 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 I, let's just let's, let's just I put just a pause say, on the whole fate thing because that's like that's like a huge it's um, a huge can of worms. That's that's unfortunate because I wanted to say a few nitpicks that I hated just to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> can I? Whatever. Okay, you know what I really hate when what anime artists draw hair over eyes and you can see the eyes through the hair. That is that such a nitpick. Crazy. <laughs> such I fucking nitpick. hate it. Why is your hair transparent, you bitch? Like it's this is like such a gorgeous show, and you're gonna nitpick a dumb detail like that. Yes, because it happens with with so many characters. It, I hate it so much. Daniel, I gotta side with Boken here. I hate seeing that stuff. Oh my so god. Much. I I could not give less of a fuck. <laughs> yeah, well I do. <laughs> Would you not I... recommend the show based on that? <laughs> yes. To everyone who has, I don't know, who has <laughs> Stay like, far away. compulsive can, disorder can, or something. Okay, can we at least agree, with that dumb nitpick aside, that it's a good-looking <laughs> show? Uh, no, because there's too, too much CGI. What? Dude, there's so much CGI that fucking bothered... That actually bothered me. It, it didn't age well. I mean, I like the I circus. Guess. Berserker looks good because you like you you said that in, in the first episode he he really is a weird entity um but there's like the mage that summons the giant creature and then a, a lot of fluids are depicted as cgi and then a lot of cars and then like motorcycles and all that shit and it just stuck out to me especially there's a there's a part where where gilgamesh is flying around on like a spacecraft or some shit which he can oh, apparently yeah. summon. Um, and it looks so yeah. bad. It looks like a 90s uh, polygon 3D effect. The, that's, that's an exaggeration. The, that, the that is an exaggeration. Is, the texture on it is terribly uh, <laughs> simplistic. It looks. I think it looks actively bad. Does it, does it push you out of the show when you see that stuff? Uh, yes. Like, from when is that show? It really felt like outdated 2011? CGI. Oh, it looked like 2000 two or something no (laughs) okay you you should see the fucking you you should see the fucking dragon from fate studio dean's fate stay night in 2006 that is probably some of the worst cgi i've ever seen in an anime yeah i mean just because another thing is bad doesn't mean this is good that's true i think i think it's fine whatever but that's like, yeah, it's maybe more than a nitpick, but it ultimately didn't bar me from enjoying the show. But I, I kind of have a grievance with um, CGI and anime in general. Okay, see, look at that picture. That is from the f- fucking 2006. Mm, oh, I hate wonderful. that. Yeah, that looks... Uh, oh, oh, boy. But yeah, we've talked like for half an hour about fate. Uh, I don't mind well, skipping it, my other topic, so you guys can. can I, I, I just, I just want to say, I am really glad that you like the show because, it, it, like I said, I'm not joking. It is like one of my favorite shows of all time, and I didn't expect you to like it as much as I did, obviously. But I am glad that you did end up enjoying it. Yeah, it's a good show. It's uh, it has some some incredibly memorable characters. Like if I ever make another list of my favorite anime characters. Ryder will be on there. Yeah, boy! For 100%. Fucking Ryder. He, he is he is a good boy. Top tier. A- a- anyways, Acer, what have you been up to? Uh, Enough of this fate uh, shit. No, before we, before we move on from fate, just how many episodes is it? 25. Uh, that's watchable. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Woo! Uh, I haven't been up to much. I read the book The Laws of Human Nature. It's by Robert Greene. Have you guys read his books? No. No. Okay, so fuck you... noobs. Oh, no. <laughs> Man, come on. Don't do this to me. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> no, uh, you've probably seen... There's a video... I can't believe I said noobs. <laughs> there... <laughs> <laughs> My brain was spinning there for a second. That came out. I'm very ashamed. It's for nerds, but... Anyway, there was a video floating around a few months ago on YouTube, which was like the 48 Laws of Power. It was like a... A 20-minute video or something. Did you guys ever... Was that ever advertised to you? No. Okay. Hmm. It had millions of views. So I'm assuming some viewers 
have seen it. Um, the guy basically writes these incredibly detailed essays about like his book, The 48 Laws of Power. He's like, this is how power has manifested in societies throughout these years. And now I'm going to spend 20 pages just describing the story of this guy, 20 pages describing the story of this guy. He, he did a similar thing with warfare and with seduction. And this new book, it's just The Laws of Human Nature. It's really good. It's, 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 it's a tier above bro science psychology, I would say. And it's very approachable and I highly recommend it. But it's still popular science. Oh yes, it's you can you can pick it up. It's real science. It's really interesting, and you'll learn so much from it. I recommend all of his books. So, what is what is human nature? Uh, Please explain in five minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm gonna go to my good friend Audible because I didn't actually read the book. Reading is for noobs, as we have <laughs> previously discussed. Uh, I listened to it on Audible. He's basically going over... Um, I think there was a chapter dedicated to Viktor Frankl, who was... Uh, he was a Jewish man in the Holocaust. Talks about, like, this is how he overcame adversity. No. Wait a minute. No, that wasn't this book. See, I'm so bad at this. Now the book is playing. Sir. Hold on. Copyright strike. <laughs> I'm trying to get the uh, back page of the book because I'm bad at describing it. You know what? I'm not doing it. Oh, no. it's, it's a good book. Take my word. You wanted Take to know me. the answer. <laughs> it's I a mean, good I've book. Stu I've studied sociology, so I'm kind of interested. What, like, where, what field is he coming from when he talks about human nature? Oh. Uh, I think he's a historian, and he's also he has some experience in game theory. I I suppose I think, where he gives the like I said, just gives crazy examples. I'm bad at uh, advertising it. I don't work in marketing, but I highly recommend just checking out the Wikipedia page for the book and seeing it. It is so much better than you would expect it to be. Also, he did a book with fifty. What? 50 cents. The, the rapper? Yeah, the, apparently. <laughs> I'm looking at it now. Wow, that's weird. That is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but really it, <laughs> anyway, I want to move on from this book because I've butchered this subject. I recommend <laughs> it, though. The other thing I want to talk about, Daniel, and this is in the vein of us surprising you with things. Oh, oh my oh. God. Oh, uh, what, a, what a twist. I see it now. Ah, uh, yes. What is it? I can't well, believe you watched the War in the Pocket. That? He told me to watch War in the Pocket because we were, talking pocket. About, we were talking about Evangelion or something, and it came up. Now. Oh, that Gundam show, isn't it? Yes, Gundam. Yes, it's that Gundam, Gundam 0080, show. 0080, War Fuck. in the Pocket. We're really turning into an anime podcast. I know. <laughs> 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 the the ultimate weeb cast. Uh, what have you guys so how, done to me? <laughs> okay, so what did you think? How did you feel about it? Okay, so my when I, before I watched it, I thought Gundam was this. Oh, it's like it's like Code Geass, but maybe a bit smarter and with more eighties or nineties animation, where it's these big flashy battles. This is a lot smaller. That that I was gonna say that is not war in the pocket at all. <laughs> this is a lot smaller. It's more personal, kind of. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't. Would you describe it as like a side story? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. That that's the nature of a lot of these Gundam OVAs, where uh, timeline wise, this is happening around the same time as the original Mobile Suit Gundam series, mm. and. It's kind of considered like, yeah, like a side story because they love to go back in the well, back to like that. Uh, I, th I believe it's called the Hundred Year War, and that's and uh, the Mobile Suit Gundam series, like the original, it shows the conclusion of that war. Mm. I, I need to ask you, how big is the Gundam mythos? Oh God, um, 
Like, are we talking Universal Century specifically, or I'm, I'm like, talking just the entire, like the franchise. How okay. big is it? So there's the there's Universal Century timeline, which is War in the Pocket is part of that timeline, um, and so is the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Okay. Then all right, so and there's a bunch of other ones that's part of that timeline, such as Victory Gundam, um, Zeta Gundam, which is my personal favorite. Uh, Eighth MS Team, Gundam Thunderbolt, there's a bunch. And then there's alternate universe Gundams. G Gundam is alternate universe, uh, Gundam Wing, uh, Gundam Double O. The, they, they, these are Gundam series that take place on a different timeline that have nothing to do with the Universal Century timeline. Universal okay. Century is considered the main timeline. Like, this is like the. Not, I'm not going to say the most important, but it's like. It, 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 it's like, it's the Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> well, and everything else is kind of like elsewhere, but it's like these. its own thing. Kingdom Hearts is probably like the really worst possible thing I could have compared it to. It's just what came to mind. <laughs> anyway, like, the re- yeah. <laughs> the, the, po- the, the reason I asked this because I want to make the point, I feel like this kind of stands on its own. You can just watch yes. this. That, um, that's exactly why I recommended it to you because even if it's a smaller part of a bigger whole, it still feels like a complete story. Yes. It, and it also, I don't know if they did, but like maybe they did make some nods to previous uh, entries into the franchise or something. Nothing, nothing breaks it. There's no, never no remote. Like, did you guys see Rogue One? Yeah, yes. Star Wars movie. Yeah, like there's a moment where they meet the uh, butt face guy from Episode Four, R two D two and C three P are there. It's like, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah, this doesn't need to be here. I liked Rogue One, but I, I, Ooh. I would say, fuck you. <laughs> I, no, but I, I'd say the biggest problem with Rogue One is if you're not familiar with Star Wars, that movie is not Weird. enjoyable. I would, I, I maybe not unenjoyable i may be too harsh but it's definitely difficult to enjoy yeah. it if yeah. you're not already familiar with star wars which i would say is a flaw with that film yeah but um gundam it's safe it's safe from that flaw yes I'd, uh, i would say so i would recommend it to anyone bogan have you seen it uh no i haven't i haven't seen anything gundam okay I'm the only gundam nerd here <laughs> <laughs> i feel like maybe we don't want to get too specific into the story if Bogan hasn't seen it, because I think it's good enough that you should just watch it. Uh, yes, I agree. I don't I'd, say, mm. I'd say the only flaw with the show is probably the music is a little weird at times. Yeah. I don't but, know if that's like a flaw of like the time it came out, because it's like an early, like I think it's like mid-80s production. I think it's the late 80s, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's just a flaw of like the time it came out in. And I and I kind of get like I think there's also like a purpose to it like cuz I think one of the the core themes of it is that it's supposed to be about how war is glorified and there's nothing about war that should be glorified. And I think the music is supposed to be this juxtaposition of like you're seeing horrible things happen but like the music is kind of weirdly upbeat. So, I get what they were trying to do and I really like that, but I don't think it fully worked that's yeah. how i feel about it um i don't think it ever i don't think it ever like came to this to the show's detriment though no probably not i'm not gonna i'm not as nitpicky about that stuff as spoken is with eyebrows or something no it was hair <laughs> <laughs> hey i didn't even talk about the mouth being too far back into the head Oh, God damn you. That is such bullshit. <laughs> he didn't even talk about it. <laughs> the, ma- the mouths are not like... Appropriately propor- Shut up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's uh, War in the Pocket. That's the War in the Pocket segment over. Daniel, okay. what have I'm you been doing? Like- <laughs> what have I been doing? So, uh, I actually recently read a book. I just realized I didn't Nerd. Put... Noop. <laughs> I just realized that this that the document only says one thing on it. And when I actually have a <laughs> a couple other things I wanted to talk about. So I 
read a book recently that I would lightly recommend called Super Mario, How Nintendo Conquered America. Now, okay. um, there's another book called Console Wars by Blake J. Harris that I would recommend over this one. But if you've already gone through Console Wars, I'd say Super Mario uh, acts as a solid supplementary material because Console Wars focuses much more heavily on the Sega side of things. And it does give a, you know, a decent amount of information on Nintendo side of things as well. But Console Wars is definitely more Sega focused. So Super Mario does a good job of showing things from Nintendo's perspective. It doesn't have quite the same level of narrative focus as Console Wars does. Console Wars definitely felt like a story, while Super Mario, uh, by comparison, it doesn't feel quite as narratively driven. Because Console Wars, most of it felt like it was from... um, um, from the perspective of Sega uh, of America CEO, like it, it, it primarily felt like you were following his story. Mm. While in, in Super Mario, it doesn't really feel like that. Um, w- but what is it? I was just wondering, uh, in Console Wars, since it's more about Sega, mm-hmm. you're recommending that over Mario. But I yeah. think that's difficult, and I'm doing a joke here, because how are they going to humanize Sega if it's more narrative focused? <laughs> Keep going. Eh, I'm sorry. Eh, eh, eh. It. I mean, I, because that's a great book. I recommend. I, I really strongly recommend Cons Wars. It's really good. My only real beef with it is like some of the dialogue is kind of dumb because I get what Blake was trying to do. Uh, he had to like come up with dialogue for scenes uh, that he obviously wasn't there for. Like he. He's writing this book like, you know, 20 years after the fact. So obviously he was he wasn't there for a lot of the conversations that happened. And he, he, there's only he, he did have a direct line with with a lot of the people that were there, but there's only so much he could do. So I'm, I'm guessing he just had to, like, come up with some stuff and not all of it. Like most of it sounds fine. Like, but there are some little bits here and there. Where I'm like, that's weird. But anyways. I'm going back to Super Mario. Um, my biggest problem with this book is not the lack of narrative focus. I didn't really mind that, um, but there were just some like factual errors. Like the the this guy described like Super Paper Mario as like a spiritual successor to like Super Mario World or some shit, and I was just like, what? Shouldn't no, it be Super Mario RPG. It it, it it's it's. Cl- I'd say it's arguably closer to Super Mario RPG, but it doesn't Super Paper Mario is not a spiritual successor to anything. Um, he also made it seem like Shigeru Miyamoto was the one that made um, Eternal Darkness when that was made by Silicon Knights. Um, Shigeru Miyamoto almost had nothing to do with that game, and just the way that it was phrased in the book, the it, the author, it may seem like the author was under the impression that like Shigeru Miyamoto directed that game when that's not the trick that's not the case. Mm. So um, there are some like weird factual errors here and there like that that I do think hampers the book a bit. That being said, um, it still provides some like really good insight as to what was going on behind doors uh, over at Nintendo during. Uh, the NES era, the Super Nintendo, N64, GameCube, up to the Wii. Um, we do get like a lot of insight on what they were doing around that time. And for that, I think the book is worth checking out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's also an audiobook version if you prefer. So, yeah, I'd say give it a shot. But like I said, Console Wars first. That's the better book by far. Um I and I've also been not I guess not been playing. I already beat it. I beat it in a single sitting. I beat Super Hot. Have, it, have any of you guys played Super Hot? Yes, I've played it. I guess Acer, you haven't. No, but I've seen plenty of videos about it. I was gonna pl- I was gonna buy VR to play it, but I didn't buy VR, so I hadn't. I didn't well, play it. Okay. Well, I played it on PC 
I did not play it with VR, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's a very fun, innovative game. Um, well, I don't know if there's any have, if there's ever been a game that uses the uh, the core gameplay mechanic that this game does, where it kind of lies to you a little bit. Uh, in the beginning of the game, it says time moves when you move. That's technically not true. When you're yeah, standing still. still yeah, when you're standing still, things still move. They just move very slowly. Hmm. But it still moves enough where, like, if you're not careful, you could still die from, like, shotgun blast or whatever. Hmm. Now, this game was pretty tough, actually. Not, not like, not obscenely difficult or anything. Like, if you just try hard enough and you keep at it, you'll eventually beat it. Um, I beat it in a single sitting. But there are some parts especially later on, where it gets pretty tricky. Uh, there was one part that took me a while where you're in an office and you have to like maneuver through cubicles. And I, that one took me a while. That one that one may have been like the hardest one for me. That one took me a while. It's like a puzzle FPS, right? Yes. Yeah, So, so the, it... The I, way I've it was... Seen, well, do you, 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 it's your subject, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. The way it was once described to me was if Doom had continued to evolve, it might have become something like Superhot, where it's very challenge-focused. Thing. You can brute force it, you can maybe quick save. I don't know if you can quick save in uh, Superhot. No. But it's this very sort of puzzle-focused thing. You can brute force your way through it by trying 60 times through each level um yeah basically i wouldn't uh, the doom comparison throws me off that well, i don't know it's, why it, it's more it's in the vein of uh because a, a game like call of duty there's not you that's not puzzly you're not really thinking you're just sort of it's the strategy of cover and then shoot when you see something whereas doom it's a bit more you need to be more active and you need to sort of plan out where you're going to move and when Okay, I, 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 I didn't. Kind of I didn't that. invent. I didn't make the comparison. My friend did. I'm questioning sure. if you can really brute force this game. Like I, I would say, if like if we go with brute forcing, a close comparison would probably be Hotline Miami, where you actually yes. like r- there's no time slow there. You just go and you just go into the same routine every time until it works basically, and you figure out more and more info on the way, and eventually mm-hmm. it all clicks and you just go through it. I'm not sure because I haven't tried, but I would say in Super Hot, the AI and also the bullet patterns aren't consistent enough for you to learn such a routine and do it all on the fly. You have to stop and like actually look, okay, this guy shot over there and I can see the bullet is going to go like right in front of my face. So I'm going to sidestep to the left and then, oh, there's a weapon. I'm going to throw that and then I turn around like you, you should take the time to actually look around and see where the danger zones are. So the enemies that are placed in in a, in a level are always consistent, but enemies that are spawned will have like different weapons. So there's no way to like go through a level like the same way every time. And also now, like every every kill every a bit of damage kills you and i feel like it's sometimes it's difficult to see when you will get hit especially if you're moving yes. without time slow yeah sometimes i've i've been killed and i'm just like how the hell did i die like <laughs> and it's usually some dude that like you know popped up behind me and i didn't realize it yeah like a but, shotgun um, blast like the the outmost bullet actually still hit you even though you saw you thought you were out of the way yeah but I would say that like this feels less like a shooter. Like I've seen some people say like, "Oh, Half Life Two is better," and I'm like, <laughs> "What the fuck? Why would you compare them? Like this? Like I I think it's more fair to compare this to something like Portal. Like if we're in in, in the realm of comparisons, mm. it is closer to Portal than it is Half Life Two. I guess I when Half Life Two came out, people said Half Life Two is the most innovative shooter I've played in years. Probably, but I I really, really? enjoyed Super Did, Hot. You're not even what getting my joke. 
Yes, I did get your joke. Don't okay. worry. He's I didn't done. get the joke. Well, you haven't played the game, so you wouldn't yeah. get the joke. Well, the joke is that at the end, it encourages you to tweet out, uh, Super Hot is the most innovative shooter I've played in years. And then people started tweeting yes. that out. There's a meta aspect to Super Hot. Yeah. I see. Which I didn't much care for, I gotta admit. Um, it felt like window dressing, but I, I, I wasn't bothered by it. To me, uh, it felt like the, it was too forced. Like it's someone going boo into your face and, oh, are you scared yet? Are you scared yet? And you're like, no, fuck off. <laughs> I guess. Like, I wasn't like too bothered by it, but like, I I did think like some of the stuff they did with it, I was like, oh, that was at least kind of neat. Like, especially at the very end of the game, I was like, oh, that was kind of cool that they, they made you do that. Um, I won't say what. But I wasn't, like, compelled by the story or anything. I wasn't like, oh, man, what a cool story. Like, not really. Uh, I was just like, oh, that's kind of neat. And, you know, makes sense with the game that they made. Yeah. But, but the main reason to play this game is to play the game. Not really for the story. Um, and the art direction, though. The art direction is great. Like, I really like the use of reds and white and everything having such, like, a stylized, slick presentation to it. I think it's it's really good. And I also, um, I, I just really enjoyed how different the game felt. Like, the way that the gameplay works lends itself to a lot of tense situations. Like, I, f- I felt like almost as if I was holding my breath when I was playing through the game. And when I finally got through... A level, especially one that was giving me a hard time, it felt like I could breathe again. I'd be like, "Oh God, I fucking did it," <laughs> and that felt good. Like, and I also say, uh, if we're going back to comparisons, I, playing through the game reminded me more of games like uh, Super Meat Boy and Celeste, in that it's more about like mastering that like one screen or in this case that one area before being able to move on and the game gives you like unlimited continues bef- you know giving you plenty of opportunity to get through it and it just felt like you know it's 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 just about like hey you you know you could take your time and do as many times as you need before you can move on just like those other games and yeah i mean i recommend it it's pretty short it's only like 2 hours and you can finish it in one sitting. There are a lot do, of extra levels, though, that are extra that's challenging. That's true. That's true. If you want to take it further, there's more content. But I, I felt pretty satisfied after I finished it. I was just like, yeah, I'm done. That, that was good. I enjoyed it. Um, the only thing is, I think it's like 20 bucks or 25 bucks or something like that. I would wait for a sale. Like, especially mm. if you played it like I did, and you're only going to play through it once. Wait for it to drop down in price before you put down the money. This feels like a game I'm going to receive for free on PlayStation Plus someday. Yeah, probably. Now, that would be the best way to play it then. Mm. All right, that's that's pretty much it. We're going to take a quick break before jumping into our discussion topic. And yeah, go take a piss or something. Welcome back, everyone. And it is time for us to sip our espressos and take a look at our essay question for this episode, which is basically looking at fun in video games and if that should be the only thing a video game should be. So I was um, I was talking to someone recently and I came to the conclusion that while most games should probably strive to be fun, I don't think that's the only thing a game should be. People often look at a game that isn't fun and just immediately dismiss it as like, well, then that's not a good game. When I don't think that's in I don't think that's entirely true. I don't think games should only be fun. They shouldn't only tr- strive to be one thing. Ideally, if we're going to be treating games as like an art form, um they should be whatever the developers want the game to be. And that, and that, may, that may not always necessarily be a fun game. Uh, a prime example that I'm going to bring up is a game that I beat recently called Paratopic. 
Now, the game's like six bucks and it's only like 20 minutes long. I recommend it. I think it's really interesting. It's not what I would call a fun game at all, though. There's no real game mechanics to speak of. You know, it's it's in first person and you technically have a gun, but, you know, you don't really go around shooting anything. Um, it's The game is more about the experience. It's more about the atmosphere. It's about how weird it is and trying to piece together the narrative and the story and even trying to figure out like what character you're even playing as it's i think it's a really cool game i think it's very neat um apparently it was inspired by a movie called carnival of souls which i'm actually going to check out soon because i really enjoyed the game and i want to see where uh the game took its inspiration from one of the things i really really enjoyed about it this game is that it looks like a ps1 game like it's straight up just dead ass looks like a PS1 game. And I think that really added to the game's atmosphere. It made it feel grimy and dirty and off. And all of this, I think, added to the game's atmosphere, which I thought was a key part of the game experience. None of which made it fun, which was fine. Because I don't think the game was trying to be fun. It was trying to give you something different. So so, so did you actively dis- dislike playing it? No, um, it just it just wasn't fun. It it was interesting. In the in the same way that like just because you weren't necessarily entertained by a film in a more traditional sense, like that doesn't necessarily engaged. make it. Yeah, you were engaged. It doesn't necessarily mean it was a bad film. You were just enjoying it in a different way. Mm. What yeah. do you guys think? Um, I think, I think the uh, core. I think every game should strive to be engaging. But you can be engaging without fun. You could do, you could do it by being mysterious. You can do it by being ambient, like uh, the game you're describing. There's a. Uh, I don't know if you've played it. There's a great game. It's by like Kitty Horror Show. I think it's called like Home or Digest. No, it's called Anatomy. Where you're? Have you guys played this? You're just a guy who's in a house. I th- oh okay yeah it looks like a PS one game as well right uh well it, it's got low aesthetics but I wouldn't say it's looks like a PS one game it looks like an indie game I would say but like everything is like really pixelated yes yes yeah and like the ha ho- in the house that you walk around and it's like there's it this narrative yeah it changes and like it seems that the narrative is like a house is kind of like a body of organs or something like that yes it is it's like that game is really interesting i recommend people should just go out buy it play it takes maybe 30 minutes and um yeah that's something that's kind of more about the experience than actually having fun i agree that that game actually is like very similar to paratopic in that sense they're actually very similar in a lot of ways, um, I, although I would say Paratopic tries to have more of like a consistent narrative, even though the timeline of events is like all jumbled up. Mm. But yeah, I know that that game that you're talking about is great. Um, I also recommend it a lot. If you and I, I think these games are personify this idea that we're talking about, where yeah, okay, most games traditionally should try to be fun because ideally a game should be about like overcoming a challenge. And there is an innate sense of satisfaction that comes from overcoming a challenge, but not all games should be about overcoming challenges, such as paratopic anatomy. They're not about tests of skill. They're about immersing yourself in the game's world and getting lost in it and just feeling the atmosphere and, I think that's cool. I think that's. I, I think we should see more games like that. Do you guys? Do you guys remember the uh, the? You've both played Amnesia: The Dark Descent, haven't you? Yeah. I, do you remember the f- no, first? But okay, yeah. I know uh, what you're talking it, about. The first thing you see when you start that game is you get black screen, white text. This game is not about fun. Don't play to win. Play to be immersed. Oh yeah. Huh. And, yeah, I remember. And that's. That text is I I love seeing that text when I played it because it's such 
it really puts you in the right frame of mind for the experience to come because it's not a fun game and if you try to play it like it is you kind of you really won't be able to get into any of the parts of the game that are enjoyable like the sort of lovecraftian uh spin on the villain and all that stuff it's kind of anti-fun in a lot of ways see i wanted to bring up horror games in general because yeah i mean yeah. the horror games aren't supposed to be fun they're supposed to evoke emotion and mm. i think that's that's also what like a good puzzle game i guess does it doesn't necessarily well no not only puzzle games but um how do i explain this the first game that jumped into my head when you started this discussion was that writing on games once said in defense of uh near automata in the first section where you can't die or you have to restart the whole thing um people have you guys played that yeah i'd be uh, near automata i love that game yeah like there's there's a first two hour section or something or yeah, maybe yeah. 90 minutes where you when you die you start all over because there's no checkpoint yet and right. um people have complained about that because it's kind of punishing and you're not ex like no the game doesn't tell you that you can't die yet but there's a good reason for that there's a good story reason and um mm. I, I i guess the whole thing of automata just sending you through the same mission at least twice making you repeat a lot of shit like there's a there's a story reason behind all that and you're, you're kind of supposed to feel that frustration and that you know the, becoming impatient um yeah it's it's difficult like that is something where the game fulfills you with that emotion and it hits on a narrative level but at the same time can you then still go ahead and call it a game flaw yeah i think that brings up a gray area because uh common gameplay wisdom would dictate that is clearly a game flaw because it's frustrating, people don't like it, blah, 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 blah. But is it really when that was the intended effect? It's, it's now, tedious. Now, but... just because something is intending to be a certain way and it succeeds in that, I don't think that also necessarily makes it good. Mm. Like, if you intend to make shit and you make shit, you just make shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, good is another, another empty word, like fun. You know, yeah. you could say, was it worthwhile to you? See, because in, in Nier Automata, there's like one part in particular. I, I really don't want to spoil because it's like a very key plot point where you, you're, you're playing as a character that is broken down and like f can barely move. And you're supposed to get across a, a large distance and... That part is brutal. Like, that part is not fun at all. It is anti-fun. And you feel so frustrated going through that section. But then, after you finish that section, um, there is a, there is a, a, not a revelation, but like there is a, a plot point that happens right after that. That like it, it almost like as if all that frustration just felt just washes away and you're just left. It's it's just replaced with this other emotion and you're just like, I think that's what they that's what he wanted. Like Yokotar wanted you to feel that sense of frustration, just to like to mess with you and then like sh show you this other scene. Yeah, and that's yeah that's really the part where it comes down to intention, right? Like uh, I remember that part. Um, I remember liking that part despite the fact that a lot of other triple a games um do something similar but have different intentions for it like there are in current triple a games or like especially games from five years ago there's a lot of walkie talkie but it's not actually a cutscene. like you you just lose control of your character he can only walk forward and he talks to someone else on the phone or something that is a common occurrence in triple a games and oh, it's that, was like, a, that was even in Metal Gear Rising, and I hated yeah, it in that Yeah, that, fuck game. that so hard. And it's, I it's love the Metal game, Gear Rising, but it's the God, game that forcing sucked. story onto you, trying to be cinematic because it's like then the camera just shows you something and it forces you to go, oh, look at how amazing we are with our technology. And in, it, I hate those parts, but in Nier it didn't 
bother me because um, there was a good story reason for it and they fucked with you in a lot of other ways like they fucked with your vision um they fucked with your controls and it, i know it, it's yeah because there was the intention there for you to be frustrated and in, in other triple a games they don't intend to you f for you to be frustrated it's just the end result because they continuously take away control in a game where it shouldn't happen one thing I really respect about Yoko Taro is that, and he, I think he believe I believe he said that in a GDC called uh, "Making Weird Games for Weird People," where he said that the game itself is not important. You know the, the what's important is how the game makes you feel, and that's what he wants to do more than anything else. Yoko Taro just wants to make the player feel something more. Th more than making a fun game or more than making or more than writing like a great story or anything. He just wants to elicit emotions out of people. And I can, even if you may not necessarily agree with that, I think that's something that you sh that one should at least respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I actually like, I'm currently working on my game of the year video and uh, my number one game of the year, which I'm not going to reveal, but I say something similar because like, it's a Game of the Year video, I'm necessarily recommending these games, right? But I yeah. feel like my number one Game of the Year is something I barely can recommend to people because the reason why it's so high up for me is that it just... It, it touched me on an extremely personal and emotional level that I'm not sure other people will recreate when they play it. Right. And that's... I, I wouldn't say... Like, it, it has good mechanics... Um, it is fun in that sense, but it's not just about that. I'm not trying to go like, yeah, this this game is worth your 20 bucks because it has so much game time and so many gameplay variants. It's just, it's a fucking, like, it's, it's art. It's not a game, it's art. And uh, it's not about the fun that brought me, but how it, it made me feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Acer, do you have uh, any final words? Yeah, well, about fun. There's also, I've played so many games where I would have really enjoyed this if it wasn't so much fun. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, like you, you guys look at the like the Bioshock games. Why the hell isn't that more horror? Why is that a sh well, like why is that an action shooter? And I enjoy. Yeah, I enjoy yeah. those games, but. That is, they are so miscast into this mold of being enjoyable AAA shooters. Basically, Bioshock really shouldn't be a first-person shooter for fun. It should be a more ambient or ambient experience or something about like more horror, something uh, closer to maybe Soma, which well, is also underwater. <laughs> 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 no, but even like System Shock Two, that's not really a fun game, but. That's, I think that's the best of these sort of shock games because it is the least fun probably, but it it gets what it's trying to say across very effectively. Which the fun parts of Bioshock really sort of go against what the story is about. Yeah, like especially Bioshock Infinite. Uh, Matthew, especially Matthew Infinite. Matosis has has laid that out pr pretty uh, properly. Yes. Where he like he compares um, he compares a game where you are trying to escape with uh, an innocent person from yeah. this place. Apes uh, Odyssey. Yeah, with Apes Odyssey, which is actually a game where you don't actively kill a lot of things, where you are hiding and you're saving people. And Bioshock, because it's from the era where you know shooters were big and cover shooting is big, it just has to be a shooter, and you have to kill billions of people. Even yes. though it, it completely destroys the characters. Yeah, like this, that story is about redemption and all that. And how we can always choose redemption and blah, blah, blah or something like that. But it's also, this guy killed 700 people just on his way to get you. What are you talking about? There's no <laughs> redeeming him. Yeah. And I mean, you can still make a, a stealth game fun. But it's just, it's it's not... 
It's not what mainstream audiences would consider to be fun, so that's why they didn't do it, and that's where the artistic vision kind of gets undercut by uh, by convention and by mainstream. Yeah, I didn't like Bioshock. Fuck that game. <laughs> I think it has a lot of interesting ideas. I just wish that actually, I just wish that the producers had less of a say, and Ken Levine could have done it more like he did System Shock too. Actually, very interesting, since uh, I was on the topic of video game books earlier, there's actually a book called Significant Zero, which is uh, written by the guy that wrote Spec Ops The Line, and he mainly writes about how he got into the video game industry, mm-hmm. and uh, he actually did work on Bioshock, Oh, and uh, he was actually the person that came up with all the screenshots. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a... Wait, uh, all the a bit of a fun fact. Yeah, he created all the screenshots. I I think he also helped test the game. Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, it's a great book, actually. Even though I don't like Spec Ops The Line itself very much. Um, I think it's a really good book. I recommend it. It's... Because, like, a lot of other video game books are about, like, kind of, like, the industry as a whole. Um, I think what's interesting about this book is just... It's just how seeing how this one guy kind of like stumbled into the industry <laughs> and made a name for himself. So I, I, I recommend it. it I, I, I liked it, but um, yeah, I think, I think we pretty much exhausted this discussion point. Would you guys agree? Yeah. I'm sure there are a billion other examples you could bring out, but yeah, sure. But it's, I it's, think we it's such covered a our huge bases. discussion and I think it's, it's an evolving discussion because games are slowly moving away from having to be fun. But then at the same time, like that is actually another point I could bring up. I like having fun. I like having a challenge. Of course. Uh, when Fury came out, that was a game that reminded me how much fucking fun it can be to just ram your head against the wall for an hour <laughs> before you beat a boss. And that no, sometimes yeah, that's no, no. exactly what I want from a fucking video game. So yeah, it's, I don't it's think any of us are saying all, otherwise. You know? Yeah, none of us are saying that like we don't enjoy a challenging, fun game. We're literally only just saying that games can be more than that. We can have games that are doing different things. Yes, games and should be cool. more than that. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, actually, now that I think about it, uh, one of the first games that I can think of at least, well... I was going to say Ico, but now that I think about it, there's probably like Out of This World and Flashback, like those games probably did it even before Ico, that were trying to be more than just fun or like the traditional fun. So it, it's, it, I think this is something that has been toyed around with over the years, but it's been making more of a, of a splash in recent years. Right, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, why don't you guys plug your stuff? Boken, go ahead. Uh, my channel is called Boken Jima. I've been having actually quite a bit of growth lately because my, my one video blew up and it's now yeah, over 100,000 100, views. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, the YouTube algorithm, it favored you. Yes. <laughs> I was chosen for a while. The chosen one. So yeah, I'm, I'm catching up on you guys. Uh oh. <laughs> Gotta start producing videos again. <laughs> yeah, I'm still looking forward to that Silent Hill three commentary. Whenever you get around to that. Oh my god, I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. But yeah, my my channel Asia Aesthetics. I have fun. I'm gonna make a video. I'm I'm working on Chrono Trigger. Stop pestering me about what video I'm gonna make on the comments. I'm doing it. Just took some time I'm, off. I'm looking forward to that. It's really fun. Like that game. My God. I feel like this is how people must have felt like when they first discovered Dragon Ball. I hate Dragon Ball, but I love Chrono Trigger. That's a weird comparison. That's... Well, it's the same artist. Uh, what's his name? Akira Kira Toriyama. Yeah, sure, but Toriyama. Tor- Toriyama. Uh, I'm not sure. What I mean, they're different. Else they they're have entirely common. different experiences. Yeah. <laughs> okay, they look different. <laughs> they look the same. Fine. I don't know anything about Dragon Ball. I just know I hate it. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's a good I mean, opinion to have. I mean, 
Dragon Ball, the original, I would say, is better than Dragon Ball Z. Ooh. People don't like just to throw, hear that, do they? I'm probably not, I'm, but I'm just going to throw that out there. If you are not a fan of Dragon Ball Z, which is what everyone likes, you might enjoy Dragon Ball because it's a more... Because Dragon Ball Z is all about, like, power levels and shit. Yeah. I'm, I'm simplifying it. Obviously, there's more <laughs> Dragon to Ball it than Z that. is what people think of when they think of Dragon Ball. Right. Dragon Ball but the, normal is very different and way quirkier and way more... I don't know. There's, it's, there's more side stories and all that shit. It's an adventure anime. That's yeah. the difference. Mm. Dragon Ball Z is a fighting shonen. Dragon Ball is a cute adventure show where uh, the characters just go on fun, quirky adventures. And I think it's more enjoyable. Yeah. But anyways. You'd, you'd say that uh, Dragon Ball Z is a lot more like... Uh, nah, I'm not doing a Yu-Gi-Oh comparison. Getting sidetracked again. <laughs> <laughs> Finish the show. Car games on motorcycles. <laughs> I feel so bad that I brought it up. It's like a part of myself that I can never disclose again. <laughs> uh. So, yeah. Anyways, uh, if you want to check out my dumb stuff, it's uh, at Shintai Reviews on Twitter, and uh, you can also look up Shintai Reviews on YouTube. I have, I'm have. i working currently on a few different things. I wanted to make a video on Paratopic because I really liked it. So you may see something on that. But I think primarily I'm going to try working on my Tales of Zestiria review, which is going to be a massive, massive takedown on that game because that game is a hugely disappointing title in the Tales of series, which is one of my favorite JRPG series ever. And that game hurt me. It hurt me bad. So I have to hurt. I have to hurt it back. Um, that's probably going to be like an hour and a half long video of me just like completely tearing it apart, limb from limb. So look What's forward it? to that. You should do like um, Tales of Sisteria. Is it wasn't just killed. It was murder. It didn't just die. It was murder. You should do that kind of video with it. By me. By me. <laughs> This character is a Mary Sue, and what does this mean for female leads or whatever? I see those thumbs. No, 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 I would never do that. <laughs> because they're always from channels yeah, with not, guys who I'm, have I'm like, not uh, down with that kind these of shit. animal fur. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hello? I don't like that. Hello? You said something about animal fur? <laughs> <laughs> you conveniently cut out. <laughs> Let's end this. All right. This okay, I'm been... back. I'm back. Oh, oh We're ending I'm this? ending it. <laughs> I'm I'm ending it. Oh, you're ending it. Okay, okay. Oh, wh- okay. Well, fine, fine. Go ahead. What did you want to say? Go ahead. I feel like we're getting uh, worse at outros. <laughs> <laughs> this has been AC Aesthetics. I'm signing out. <laughs> You motherfucker. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right, this has been Essays and Espresso. This ends Daniel's horrible tenure as host. You're, you cannot pin this on me. Fuck you. <laughs> I did nothing wrong. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye.